Okay, this is Stefan Kinsella. This is the Kinsella on Liberty podcast. Today is February 28th, 2013. Uh, today's show is a little bit different than, uh, than normal. This is kind of a personal uh, themed uh, podcast episode. So some people may not be interested in all, in all, at all in this, and that's fine. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm talking with my good friend Jack Chris. Uh, Jack, say hello. Uh, Stephen, good morning. How are you? I'm I'm perfectly well today. I worked out this morning already, Jack. Have you run yet? Uh, no, I haven't run yet. But but look, you kind of set us up poorly. I think now. I think a lot of people are going to be interested in this. This is going to be <laughs> probably the most fascinating discussion you've ever had. <laughs> well, you see, you're you're a professional radio guy. You can obviously tell that I'm not. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a different well, approach to this, and uh, this is not going to be an interview of you by me, since I'm not an expert at that. But I think we just have a conversation and. Uh, you might want to steer some of this too, but uh, let me just uh, explain to um, listeners uh, who you are and uh, how we know each other. Uh, you're what are you? You're 47 too, right? Like me? Yeah, yeah. Getting getting close to 48, closer every day. You know, you yeah. Both. And we've known each other since 1988, maybe. It, it was 88. Yeah, uh, and, and we can go into that. It, it's kind of interesting because our our philosophy and, and politics kind of led to our meeting, as you recall. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's yeah, been, tw what, 25 years now? Tw yeah, um, long time. And you, um, um, before we go into that, uh, so uh, tell people who you are. Well, again, Jack Chris. I live in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, Stefan, I am a uh, business publisher, both online and in print. I'm kind of one of the dinosaurs hanging on to uh, print publications. Uh, I am a published author. Uh, my collection of uh, political and philosophical essays, uh, Ready, Aim, Right, came out in 2004, Quail Ridge Press. And I'm currently uh, finishing up some revisions on a book that I have been working on uh, for some time called uh, The Great Greek Philosopher, Aristotle for Children. And my 11-year-old daughter, Dagny, is illustrating that book for me. So, um, and some other projects as, as well, but an entrepreneur, and uh, and I dabble in political philosophy, as you know. So. And as your um, as your your daughter's name might indicate, you have uh, <laughs> you and I might have might have an Ayn Rand connected uh, uh, past there. Well, yeah, and I guess that would be a good way to to kind of segue into the introduction on, on how we met. You know, it was um, in 1988. I was. Uh, doing talk radio in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, we, uh, the station I was working at at the time, uh, was the first talk radio station in Mississippi. And uh, WJNT, and they, right? Yeah, WJNT. It's still, Jack, still Jackson in, Jackson News Talk. Is that what that stood for? Uh, News Talk 1180. Yeah. And I was the resident libertarian. Uh, in fact, I think prior to meeting you, I had interviewed Ron Paul, who was then running for president on the LP ticket. Uh, had interviewed uh, Murray Rothbard. Um, yeah, I have a picture of you, uh, a black and white picture of you and uh, Murray uh, in Jackson when he visited, and uh, I might put that on yeah. the uh, on the podcast uh, um, blog post about this. Uh, that's a good picture, uh, one of my favorites. And uh, well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of people I had the chance to meet, and you know, in those days, and, and this is kind of interesting for some of your younger listeners. I mean, this is all pre social media days. We didn't have computers. I mean, we. A uh, fax was something exciting in those days, and no yep. one had cell phones. So, you know, I would call up these these universities where these professors taught. I mean, you know, I just called Tibor McCann one day at Auburn, Alabama, and introduced myself. But, but you had um, I had interviewed David Kelly, uh, who uh, many of your listeners know is now the uh, uh, I believe the executive director of the Atlas Society in Washington D.C. and, and renowned objectivist philosopher had interviewed him, and you had, I think, written, David, about uh, the possibility of meeting some Southern objectivist, and he referred you to me, and you wrote a letter, and then we eventually met. So it was kind of interesting. And, you know, that took a process of, of probably weeks, if not months, and now you can just click an email or a uh, oh, yeah. chat, get in touch with people. Yeah, uh, that, was, uh, that was around the... There was an that was around 87, 88, and I was just starting law school around then, and uh, I think I'd been corresponding by, you know, typed, typed printed letters in the mail with yeah. Kelly for a while, and he, had, yeah. he'd writ, he wrote me back several letters over a period of months, and, uh, you know, I was alone in Prairieville, Louisiana, 
I was kind of into Rand and mildly into libertarianism at the time, and I think you were similar, or you were maybe more into libertarianism than me at the time. But um, we were both into objectivism to a certain degree, and uh, I think I was alone, and I just kind of asked Kelly if he knew anyone around the area, and he said, he wrote me back, and he said, well, there's a guy in Jackson, Mississippi. I mean, you know, Baton Rouge to Jackson was, what was that, about three, four-hour drive, something like that? Yeah, yeah, about three or four hours, and uh, and there were so few of us, you know. I mean, I, I think I remember responding to you. I, I mean, I was so glad to meet a fellow, uh, you know, libertarian uh, objectivist. Uh, it was really exciting news to me because there was no one here. Even, you know, in Jackson, this is we have three colleges uh, and a university in town. The people, you know, might have read Atlas Shrugged. Uh, no one knew about Ludwig von Mises. Uh, a few people knew about Ayn Rand, uh, and I was uh, I was essentially alone. So it's it's interesting how things have changed in the in the uh, intervening twenty five years. It really is. Yeah, and you and uh, I were, were uh, around a similar age, and we had similar interests, and so we started corresponding. And then um, I drove to Jackson several times to visit you, and you drove to Baton Rouge a couple times, visited me. So we we uh, and I think you even interviewed me on your show. I even have that one still in the voucher system. I think it was kind of pro-vouchers back then. Um, and I think another time I was there, I was in the studio watching you do your show. And your show was so good, and your voice is good, as people can tell. Um, but you interviewed amazing people. You interviewed you, Lou Rockwell. You interv interviewed uh, Murray Rothbard. You interviewed, um, I remember, Bob Schaefer. Um, I don't know if you interviewed Tibor, but you interviewed a lot of the luminaries of the time. And... Uh, um, unfortunately, we've lost a lot of those tapes. Um, otherwise, yeah. they'd, they'd make good podcasting material. Um, but uh, one time I was in the studio, and uh, I was just listening to you interview. Uh, you were interviewing Lou Rockwell, and at a, at, during one of the breaks, uh, you know, he was. we were just waiting during the commercial. And so I, I got online and told Lou I had read a lot of the stuff from Mises Institute and, um, and was happy to meet him, and he was very cordial and nice to me. And so that was my first kind of meeting with Lou in, in your studio on the radio. That was um, that was a lot of fun. And I had forgotten about that. You know, Lou did a weekly show with me. Uh, we did, I believe, every Friday. And one of the highlights of my life and career at that point in 1988, I took a summer, uh, I called it a pilgrimage, to Auburn. And uh, met Lou Tibor, Mark Thornton, uh, I believe Jeff Tucker was mm -hmm. there, if I'm mm -hmm. not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And I spent two or three days just uh, roaming the campus and and sitting in on classes and and uh, you know hanging out with these people. And uh, to me, you know, I was 23 years old. That was the equivalent of I, I guess some of these kids going to the beach or something. Yeah, you know, we sound like a bunch of old geezers talking about this, but. But it is fascinating in perspective to, to look at how nascent this was. Even though the movement had been uh, in existence for many, many years, as we know, still in those days, it was all via mail and, and telephone calls. And people, especially here in the South, I mean, where, where we were, you were in Prairieville and I was in Jackson, they didn't really know about libertarian ideas. And this was very, very radical at the time. You think it's radical now. In those days, when I would interview someone like David Friedman or Lou Rockwell would come on the air, I remember after the Exxon Valdez spill, uh, Lou came on the air and he said, okay, I'm going to go fill up at Exxon uh, today. I'm going <laughs> to, uh, you know, it just all this stuff, it sounded so blasphemous. It yeah, was so yeah. counter to everything, the prevailing, uh, uh, you know, news uh, media at the time. And it was a lot of fun for me. Uh, yeah. Just these ideas out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, Steph, and I was uh, privileged. I look back now, it's kind of, uh, it's almost all inspiring at the time. I didn't realize all these people I was talking to. Yeah, uh, right. And, and just how wonderful it was. You know, Murray Rothbard was, was the <coughs> most, uh, what a gen gentleman, excuse me, um, just the nicest, um, very... You know, you read his works, and and it, they're so it's so strong. The words are so powerful, and and well reasoned and logical and hard hitting. You would expect this monster of a man, you know, this this fire breathing philosopher, and yet he was just so quiet and humble and and, and in person, you know. Um, 
and uh, great people I got to, to meet. So anyway, that, that's all the reminiscing. I <laughs> yeah, and, and the reason I started out a little bit um, uh, in the beginning of the podcast uh, uh, talking about uh, how this is personal, um, I just, you know, this is, I just wanted to warn people, this may be a little self-indulgent, but I think this history is important too. And, you know, in a sense, I always hate these older kind of geezers that say, you know, in my day, it was like this. Uh, right. And I don't really, you know, you and I are one generation or so behind the modern kids who are just steeped in the internet and everything. Uh, but we're, I, you know, we're only in our late 40s, so we're not really old geezers yet. Um, and uh, so, we, you, you know, we, we, we have lived the uh, internet revolution Um um, and, you know, I remember you and I, we went to, I think we went to a few Mises Institute conferences together, so we, we would meet up there, too, and have a lot of fun. Um, you visited me yeah. in Pennsylvania when I lived in Philadelphia. You visited me there um, once or twice. We had a blast there. Well, and you were always, uh, you know, kind of ahead of the, the curve. It was, and, and I say this, I mean, we're friends and everything, but it's, it's astounding to me just how quickly you took... Uh, these ideas and and essentially forge your own path. I mean, so often in our movement, uh, and I say our movement, the libertarian <laughs> movement, quote unquote, and you see this today. There are a lot of people who, uh, unfortunately, may not think originally. Uh, they tend to uh, adopt a set of principles for whatever reason, perhaps correct reasons, but then maybe they don't, uh, 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 you know live by them or understand them fully, but you, you took these principles and went your own way. And, uh, and I respected that immensely. And I think, you know, your stature today, uh, it's very impressive. And I, I'm kind of pleased, you know, as a friend, uh, and proud of the fact that you did do this. I mean, you never were pinned down to one ism or, and you understood that that perhaps was not the way to liberty in the first place. Uh, when so many others, and, and you know who I'm talking about, we saw people, mm -hmm. uh, we lacked, people who uh, really were clones of the philosophy uh, they espouse, and that's not thinking at all. Well, I think uh, when we started becoming good friends, 88, 89, it was kind of the tail end of, of our more hardcore objectivist infatuation, although you're still probably more interested in it than I, and we can talk about that, but uh, we were both sort of becoming anarchists, I think, at the time, right? Um, and more, so, more libertarian, yeah. And but if you remember, you and I, and you, were, you, you reminded me of this the other day. Um, you and I went to um, this conference in Dallas in 1988. It was called Meeting of the Minds, and it was, it was the 89. 89. 89. And it was the yep. last, uh, you told me it was the last uh, objectivist conference Kelly did w before he founded uh, iOS Atlas or something like that. But it was David Kelly, um, uh, John Got uh, Gotthelf, Alan Gotthelf, Alan Gotthelf John Redpath. And I thought there was one other, but anyway, uh, we had a lot of fun there, and, and Kelly's lectures were fantastic, and we we got to meet David, and uh, I've always liked that guy. He's he's a fantastic thinker, um, and speaker, very eloquent, sincere, uh, amazing mind. Um, and but yeah. you remember there was a weird uh, event with with the with the with the Barbara Brandon book there. Yes, I do. In fact, I was just about to bring mm -hmm. that up. You know, it, it's funny because that was March of 89. And you, you recall when we pulled into Dallas, it was, I think, 80 degrees. Yes. And we got snowed in. There was a blizzard that yes. hit Dallas. No one knew about it. We had to stay an extra day. But yeah, there was there was some tension there at the time between Kelly and Rippath because we were, <laughs> and we were a little bit unaware of what was going on. Uh, and, and we can go into the reasons why. But that was David Kelly's last lecture at a uh, at an officially sanctioned objectivist conference and and you well, what do, what do you mean though what what was uh, that wasn't the Ayn Rand Institute was it at the time I don't think it was no it, no, it was uh, uh, Donald Heath uh, put on a conference with some uh, local Dallas uh, objectivist uh, it was kind of a regional thing but uh, but I believe ARI supplied the speakers, or at least they were all ARI sanctioned speakers. Well, it was it was basically the orthodox objectivist, put it that way, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, and and you and I, yeah, we were at an after hours uh, event. I remember uh, Alan Godhell, who some of your listeners may know, he's a very well known Aristotelian scholar and a, a, a objectivist. Uh, he was teaching people how to do the stroll. Uh, <laughs> I don't, you remember I don't, that? I don't and, remember that. And I was that. so amazed. I was so amazed because I, I didn't think objectivists had fun, you know. It was, it was <laughs> odd for me to see objectivists taking drinks and dancing. But anyway, um, yeah, you and I were 
were in the in a group and some some young kids uh, objectivists were talking about whether or not it was uh, the proper thing to to uh, perhaps burn Barbara Brandon's book. The well, and the, I Rand. think that came out. It was called The Passion of Ayn Rand, and that that yeah. biography came out in '86, if I recall. And That's right. it was it was sort of uh, banned by the you know Peakoff type effect, official objectivists and. Uh, uh, because it, it revealed a lot of details about personal issues between Nathaniel Brandon and Ayn Rand, et cetera. And I think um, Kelly was getting in trouble because uh, with the uh, with the Orthodox guys because he had published a positive review or said something positive about the the biography, right? He had. He had published a or uh, yeah, I believe he had published a review by Robert Bidonato, uh which was uh, not totally. Uh, uh, a glowing review of the book, but it was it was not, you know, Peter Schwartz was calling Barbara Brandon Weiss, and Leonard Peikoff was saying that he wouldn't even read the book and no one should. So that was the kind of atmosphere uh, that was at the conference. And you and I were standing there listening to these young people talk about uh, the morality of burning a book, and I remember we both looked at each other and our jaws dropped. You know? Yeah, I think you know, this kid, had, I think the kid actually said he had bought the book, but when he started realizing that it was being denounced by the, the high priests, um, that he went into his backyard and had a book burning ceremony. I think he, he I think he literally burnt the book to show you know to please the gods or something. And uh, yeah, and I wonder you wonder where this kid is today. You know, is I don't know. He, maybe he's in for Hitler Youth or something. I you know? don't know. I don't know. Um, but um, that was the only objectivist conference I've ever been to. Uh, I think you've been to a couple of others since. But that's it. After that, I started going to Mises Institute things um, and getting involved more in Austrian economics and. You know, I uh, spoke at, um, in 2006 at the Atlas Society. I gave uh, two lectures, um, and Nathaniel Brandon was there, Tibor McCann. Uh, I believe that was, uh, may have been Robert Bettinato's last appearance before he, too, left uh, the Atlas Society. And, you know, you're right. I mean, David Kelly, a, a brilliant uh, mind, and um, it, it has saddened me uh, over the years to see uh, all the schisms uh, it angers me somewhat. It also saddens me. And, and you know, I am not the objective as I used to be, uh, but I still admire Ayn Rand yeah. greatly. And, and you and I have had this discussion. I think that, that most people do enter uh, either anarcho-capitalism or libertarianism through Rand, and, and I still think that that's probably the best entry or entree for anybody, uh, you know, to read Atlas Shrugged. Uh, I, yeah, it's, um, I've kind of, I keep going back and forth on this. Uh, I got really sour on the whole Randy movement because of the cultism and the and the and the kind of um, the humorlessness of among a lot of them and and her her anti anarchism and then now her her pro IP views. But um, uh, and I don't think she's the main entree into libertarianism anymore. I think she was and she's still a major one. But I think like the Ron Paul type movement. Brought in so many people through Austrian economics and all that. Uh, that's just kind of my anecdotal impression. But um, um, no, and you I've, may be right. Yeah, yeah I've also re I've come to reevaluate like the Fountainhead. I used I used to love it, and that's the first one I read by her. Um, because to me now the Fountainhead is it, it has individualism in it, but in a weird way. I mean, here you have an architect who refuses to do what his customers want. I mean, that's kind of weird. And then the one of the central, you know. Uh, Plots of the story, plot lines of the story is he he blows up someone else's private property because of, of IP. So I, it basically is IP terrorism. So I think the Fountainhead. I, I don't even recommend it. I say I, I say do not read the Fountainhead. Um, now Atlas Shrugged, on the other hand, I'd kind of in my mind that it soured. Like I'd read it two or three times years and years and years ago. Probably fifteen years ago was the last time. And with the movies. I decided to – I watched part one of the movie, and I, I forgot exactly what happened in parts two and three. So I re started reading the novel, picked it up at part – you know, basically where part two would start. And uh, I loved it. I, it was much better than I thought. I guess I'd bought into all these these haters over the years who say it's got wooden characters and stilted dialogue. I think she carefully constructed that novel. The characters are not supposed to be realistic, and uh, it's just great. Um, it's a really great novel. Yeah, I, you know, I think The Fountainhead may be a better written novel. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I, think I think I'm so. a better writer now than I was 20 years ago. And when I reread these books now, I tend to, you know, notice that it's not the message so much that, that hit me, you know, when I was, you know, 18 and I first read it. Now I look more at the, uh, how it's written, you know. Um, and I think The Fountainhead may be a better written book. But yeah, I agree with you. 
uh, about Atlas. And, you know, it's an interesting, Stefan, that um, now it seems that, that the Randians and the objectivists are trying to possibly open up a bit more than they did when you and I were first entering the movement. I mean, Ayn Rand Institute has a very charismatic younger guy, Yaron Brook, uh, who is uh, kind of, you know, offering uh, the, the, the stick out to a lot of conservative groups and even libertarian groups. And when you and I were just entering the movement, that, was, that would never have happened, uh, as you recall. And uh, that may shock some of your listeners. I mean, you know, at one time, the twain never met. Right. You know, you would never have any interaction between the Mises Institute, say, and ARI. I'm not saying you have a lot now, but, uh, you, you know, you never would have dreamt that you would have seen an Ayn Rand group at, say, uh, a Students for Liberty conference or at the, uh, what's the um, conservative conference that was just held in young, D.C.? Is that young, big... young Americans for Liberty? Well, the other one, the one that uh, Chris Christie was not invited to, you know, uh, the, the big one. Um, I, the, the, the name escapes me now, the, but not, I believe that. The, the Federalist Society, you don't mean that one? Not the Federalist Society, no. This is a big event in D.C. that just took place. In fact, uh, I had a, a young friend of mine who is with Students for Liberty, and he sent me a text saying, I'm sitting next to David Kelly. You know, the Atlas Society had a booth there, and I believe the Ayn Rand Institute had a booth there as well. Oh, is that uh, the thing? That's the thing that uh, I think Jeff Tucker went to, and because uh, he, he said he talked to, to David Kelly there too. Uh, yeah, it's a Anthony, big conference. Anthony but... Gregory, uh, I forgot what it's called. Student, uh, I don't remember what it was called. But, um, but the objectives still have this sort of latent kind of conservative idea that, you know, our natural alliance, like the libertarians have a natural alliance with the conservatives, whereas nowadays that sort of idea is dissipating among a lot of radical libertarians. Like they think we have more in common with left libertarians in some ways, right, or even even some parts of the civil libertarian left uh, than with these kind of straight – you know these uh, moral majoritarian type conservatives. Um, I don't know if we have much in common with any of them, to be honest. I mean, there are some right. ways we can make inroads, but I really don't like the idea that the Republicans or the conservatives are our natural sort of home or allies. And yeah, I was going to say even further. I think we're seeing uh, the objectivists and some libertarians hang on to the notion, and the Libertarian Party included, that change can be made through the political system. Uh, and I know that in reading your your articles and, and posts on Facebook and blogs, uh, you have really stood by your principles that you know we, we can't work through a system that is uh, you know rotten to the core. And yeah. many of us still believe and still get excited about the fact, or revel in the fact that they can get the ear of a congressman or a yeah. congresswoman. I, know. I mean. They, and, and I, I don't think, and you and I have discussed this in private, I don't think that just because, you know, Paul Ryan has read Atlas Shrugged that that's going to make any difference. Uh, you know, I mean, let's face it, a lot of people have read Atlas Shrugged, a whole lot of people, and we haven't seen just a ton of cultural change. So I, I don't know what it's going to take, but I think the, if I may be so bold to say, I, I think the objectivist movement is a little bit... Um, behind the curve and thinking that they can work through politicians and, and change the culture. I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's, it's demonstra demonstrably that it's been shown it, it can't happen. I mean, you could argue that if more American citizens had read Atlas or had read you know, Murray Rothbard or Austrian Economics or Henry Hazlitt or Bastiat, then that might make a difference because naturally the politicians are going to cater to the prevailing ethos and sentiments in society. So that's how politics will get better is if we change the attitude of the of the masses, not the politicians. The politicians are always going to cater to, you know, uh, what they can get away with by, by popular sentiment. Um, it's just unrealistic to think. I mean, Ron Paul was such an anomaly, right? And and um, 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 and but I would say that you know, um, let's to close off the objectivist stuff. Um, um, you know, her her four basic points of her philosophy was is reality and realism. Um, uh, you know, epistemological realism, um, self-interest, and capitalism. And in broadly stated, I think you and I, and even like Rothbardians, would agree with all those. We just think that capitalism means anarchy, or at least I do, and uh, we we think that. That would imply no intellectual property. So we would disagree with the Randians on their application of those principles, but the four general principles, uh, I think, are uh, um, are solid. And so, depends on what you mean by objectivist. But uh, now you, I want to turn. Go ahead, if you don't mind. Sure, Jeff, go ahead. Let me let me play interviewer. I want to turn the question because we we 
started talking about how we first met 25 years ago, which mm-hmm. is kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. So do you think, uh, I'll put the question on the table for you to answer, do you think that this country is, is more open or, or uh, 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 we are more open as a nation to the ideas that you and I were interested in 25 years ago today than we were then? I don't know if... I don't know if the the people, the masses, or 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 for 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 a long time, going to really be interested in ideas in this kind of libertarian intellectual sense. I mean, libertarians attract the people that are kind of interested in working these issues out and studying these things. Um, so I don't, and I don't know if the change has to come that way anyway. What what I do think is that um, there's been a gradual kind of background appreciation, you know, seeping into journalists and professors and people an appreciation for the the need for free markets now they're not pure they're not consistent but you know the soviet union collapsed in 90 90 or something like that and right, uh, yeah. you know that's a good a good teaching lesson to people they n- now people kind of have a sense that central planning is going to not work um, so I think that, that, you know, things like that. And then I think the emergence of all this decentralized technology and sort of the ability to have, be an entrepreneur with just very low, um, startup cost, you know, and infrastructure cost now, um, and this sort of dynamic attitude of, of the young internet generation, um, has made people just more entrepreneurial. So I think in a way they're more and, and I think people are generally more pro civil liberties, you know, and they're generally more for economic freedom. It's just that they want they want their security as well, and they're inconsistent on war, right? So there's a lot of work to do. But I think there's there is, I mean, you, you can see Austrian economics is mentioned in main, fairly mainstream press now. It's known. It's not obscure anymore. Uh, libertarianism is as well. So I think there is more receptiveness to it, but. Um, um, you know, not enough yet. Well, it's, it's interesting and frustrating at the same time when I see uh, posts, for example, from the American Conservative, which I, I appreciate as a good publication, a, a well-written and interesting publication. Recently, they posted something on a blog about the fact that conservatives need to realize that being pro-war is also being pro-welfare. But at the same time, you see, or we hear uh, a president who just gave a State of the Union address where he was as blatantly collectivist as any president since Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1964. And so you wonder how much really has changed. I mean, you know, and, and yeah, we can, we can say that politics, uh, you know, is, is not, you don't have to understand it, you don't have to participate in it, but it, it, it rules us, Stephen, you know? I mean, it does influence our, uh, unfortunately, our every waking moment. Well, I, I, it does influence us, but I don't know if it rules us. Uh, I think there's a lot of distraction on that, and there's a lot of clamoring by certain people to get control of the state or to influence the state to give them favors. But there's a, a huge swath of private life that just ignores the state and goes around it. They recognize it as a dangerous predator. You know, they've got to deal with it. But I, I think the hope is not politics. Like you said, the the hope is that we're just going to. Um, Hopefully we can survive the, the coming, you know, possible catastrophes because of the state's meddling over the years. If we can survive, then I'm hopeful that just civil society and technology will allow the free market that still does remain to keep growing and gradually just outpace and outrun the state. The state is a slow, stupid, lumbering beast. And, um, you know, if they had predicted what the Internet would be, they would have killed it, right? But they can't. And hopefully it's too late for them to kill it, although they keep trying with SOPA and CISPA and things like this. Right. Um, so I'm hopeful that people will just – I mean, look, Bitcoin is maybe emerging. You know, that The state may have caused that to emerge. I don't know if Bitcoin would ever emerge in a free market. You just have gold or something like that as money. Um, but Bitcoin is emerging as a way to get around taxes and regulations on ga- online gambling and spying on people's transactions and things like that. So – Things like this keep emerging. You know, we have encryption, we have cell phones now, we have uh, the internet, of course, and we have uh, the torrenting of files. Um, all this stuff is just really. We might reach a certain tipping point where the state just becomes more and more irrelevant, or at least, even if it keeps growing, if the economy and the private sector and technology can keep growing even faster, then gradually the state becomes a smaller percentage of life. 
you're generally optimistic, and, and you and I also have this discussion often. I, I just I wonder if there will be a significant sea change in our lifetimes, uh, and you know what will what will happen in the meantime? Will some cataclysmic event take place? I mean, no one knows for sure, and and any kind of philosophical thought is incremental. But you know, Seth, I don't think. That, that this change, this philosoph- philosophical change is going to come through think tanks. I don't know if it's going to come through uh, uh, the Internet. I, you know, I, I wonder how it's going to take place. It, it is an educational thing, um, which well, is another point of concern for me, because I don't know if, if free market philosophy philosophies are being taught to our young people. They have to discover it on their own, and usually when they're much older. Um but I wonder how this change, you know, how do you see it? Is it a, a gradual whittling away? Or, yeah, I or? think it's gradual, but it could, it, like I said, there could be some tipping point type events. But I'm not sure. It's hard to predict the future. Um, I, I wouldn't say I'm an opt- I'm optimist. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm hopeful, as I said. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that the better outcome happens, and I think it's possible. I, I am like a short, I'm a personal optimist. I mean, remember, Murray Rothbard used to say we need to be short-term pessimists and long-run optimists. Um, and I think that's probably right in case we kill ourselves off by gray goo or something like that. But I'm an optimist in my own life because, look, we live in a world where we – like in America, we have lots of opportunity, but there are dangers. So I just view the government as a, as a, as a dangerous obstacle or a beast, You know, just like the possibility of uh, a plague or disease or hurricanes or wild beasts. Um, it's just another thing we have to keep an eye on and conquer and work around and try to find a way to prosper and succeed in the face of it. It's just another challenge. It's unfortunately a challenge that shouldn't be there. But I, I think – so I'm a personal optimist in the sense that I think people can uh, succeed and have a flourishing, happy life even though there's a state out there. Uh, it's, it's harder than it would otherwise be, and that's unfortunate, but whining about it doesn't change it. Um, but as for th- well, let me uh, mention the thing you, you asked about think tanks. I think the, the role of think tanks and intellectuals, I agree, we're not going to change society, but I think it's important, number one, to keep the remnant alive, you know, like Nock talked about, although we're much more than a remnant now. But I think we're preparing the groundwork for when changes start happening and people start looking for coherent explanations. Um, so when the average person or the masses start moving in a certain direction, then there's a whole group of educated people like intellectuals and professors and businessmen who were interested in Ayn Rand when they were kids you know, who can then sort of provide a framework for people to hang their hats on. You know, when, the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, then people started getting interested in Mises' explanation about socialism because that was there right. already. So go ahead. Yeah, I was going to bring up just two related points, one positive and one maybe not so positive in my view. First of all, I think in 1988, which is where we started this conversation and you and I started our friendship, Ayn Rand uh, would have been laughed at at most colleges, uh, and, and she was, and, and I was laughed at. I think now the culture has changed. I say Ayn Rand, I'm almost talking about all the material ideas when I mention Rand, the umbrella term, Rand, the mothership, as it were. It's not laughed at. It is taken more seriously in the universities and colleges, I think. I'm not of college age, but I do interact with a lot of students and professors, and I think that's a positive thing. That the, the idea of libertarianism uh, it is not uh, you know, poo-pooed or, or, or ridiculed as it was 25 years ago. On the negative side, though, Stephen, I mentioned that uh, now I, I primarily am a salesman, uh, in my day-to-day uh, business and entrepreneur, and I meet with a lot of small business people and entrepreneurs, some of whom are very well educated, some of whom, uh, one in particular that I'm bringing up, uh, works in the financial market. And what disappoints me is, for example, I had lunch with this gentleman not long ago, and he was railing against regulation, government regulation against banks in the financial sector, and he made some very salient and, and correct points. But then he turned around in the same breath and said, however, I do think the government should take over health care. Right, right. And I think government should, you know, so there's this inconsistency. And this, this man is, is well off. He's well educated. He owns a business, too, as a matter of fact. <clears throat> and yet he doesn't himself see the inconsistency and the, the illogical uh, uh, statement he's making. And that's what concerns me. And, and he would call himself a conservative, a free right. market uh, Republican. So, you know, 
we've come, uh, we've, we've covered a lot of ground, and we have come a long way, but we've got a long, long way to go, too. Well, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I, I, I think the way to look at it is, I, I'm not a doom and gloomer in the sense that, you know, it's time to get the hell out of the country. I mean, first of all, I don't know where you're going to go. Uh, and it's just not realistic. I mean, the reason the state, the U.S. state, I mean, can tax successful Americans so much is exactly because it doesn't make sense for them to leave. Now, they have them, they have them, you know, by the short and curlies, really. I mean, if I, if, if I were to leave and go to another country, even if I find one that's freer for a while, you know, my income goes down by a factor of 10, unless I'm in a certain special field. So, you know, from my personal selfish point of view, it's better to make X dollars and have it 40% taken than to move somewhere else and have 90% lost just because I don't have as many economic opportunities. Um, but I would say that society is getting better and is getting worse. So there are two different trends, right? So the internet, freedom, uh, even the libertarian movement are getting better. Um, but some things are getting worse, like the state's getting more like a police state in terms of their, you know, the way police and civilians relationship used to be 30, 40, 50 years ago seems different than it is now. You know, it's more of yeah. a hostile relationship now um, than the friendly cop, you know, on the beat. Um, Officer friendly, yeah. Yeah, so things are getting worse in some ways. But I do believe that the reason you and I are free, are free marketeers is we believe freedom and the free market is better than the government. And it's better in a lot of ways. It is more powerful than the government. It's more productive than the government. Um, it's not centrally directed by the, like the government, and it's not evil-minded like the government. And unfortunately, destruction is easier than production. So the government, even if it's weaker in a sense than the market, can do a lot of damage. Um, so I'm, I'm, the reason for optimism is just to believe that the market will eventually defeat the state, or at least marginalize it. Uh, it's going to be a long process, I, well, I, and I, I hope, I, do, I think. I do get confused sometimes and frustrated by what gets citizens riled up. I mean, for example, uh, so often the citizenry seems very docile about issues like taxation. I mean, uh, the majority of their income can be taken away, and yet... This gun control thing just had people really, literally, no pun intended, up in arms. Yeah. You know, I mean, the internet was flooded and and with with comments and people here, you know, Mississippi, it's a rural state, a lot of hunters. Uh, you know, you would think you would have thought the world was coming to an end. Don't take my guns, and yet it's okay to take, you know, most of the money that I earn. Um, but but the other thing that interests me somewhat, and and I I do. I don't like to see all the anger back and forth, and that's why I typically stay away from people. I don't have any respect for people like Ann Coulter and yep. you know people who they're demagogues and they're a little bit batty, in my opinion. Um, I, I think libertarians, for example, could find common ground with, say, the Occupy movement. Yeah, um, I, and I think or, or the Tea Party movement. I think the both Occupy and Tea Party are, are both. Hopeful developments, uh, as was the defeat of SOPA. It's probably one of the biggest achievements of liberty in a long time. Um, or well, my, yeah. My, yeah, I agree with you. And, and many of my uh, uh, friends on the left who are highly intelligent people, I think the problem is, and this, I don't mean for this to sound condescending, but I think maybe there's some economic uh, uh, issues that they may not be uh, or understand completely. And that, you know, freedom is not. 20%, 30%, it's all or nothing. And while many people on the left want freedom in certain areas, they deny it in others, and they don't see the con or lack of consistency in their position. And the same can be said of conservatives, too. Uh, and that's still a major problem. But I think, really, I'm wondering now, because you talked about this earlier, about conservatives and making common ground with them. I'm wondering if now the, the libertarian movement actually has more in common with the left Yeah than it does with the right, I wonder. I go back know? and forth on that. I don't know. Um, uh, I, I start thinking that sometimes when I hear Republicans say horrible things, and then and then I see a, a, a leftist say something horrible, and it gets my right. hopes dashed. But there are a certain type of leftists. Of course, the left libertarians are largely great. Um, uh, they've been great on IP for a long time. They're, they're good on anti-war. Uh, I don't agree with some of their uh, personal tastes or predictions about how society might be organized in the future if we have a free society, but I don't care. I'd be happy to give it a try and see who wins. Um, 
But um, yeah, I think, and, and then even some of the civil libertarian left, like say the Cory Doctorow type people, they're they're not libertarians. They're kind of for socialized medicine, but they are strong civil libertarians. They're kind of for the free market. They're strong for internet freedom. Um, so I, I would like to get to the point where we have such a dominant case where they're trying to make an alliance with us, you know, where the, the left and the right want to make an alliance with us. And you see that to a certain degree. There's a um, this recent libertarian forum in or whatever it's called in New Hampshire. I think Cory Doctorow was there, so he's coming to the radical kind of anarchist left libertarian voluntarist crowd. So he's going there, and that's got to influence him over time because he sees people consistent and passionate. Um, as for your comment about freedom being all or nothing, I agree in the sense of making a coherent case for it. Um, but in terms of living your life, freedom is just one of the many things we need, right? We need freedom. We need you need to have health. You need to have security. You need to have shelter. And so I look at all these things as just challenges. So even if we don't have perfect freedom from the state, you know, it's up to you as an entrepreneurial human to find a way to survive and prosper and flourish in the face of it. And I think it's obviously possible. It's a challenge, especially a challenge not to be corrupted. In other words, you can yeah. if you want to go work on Wall Street and make a bunch of money. I mean, so maybe some of that's legitimate, but you know, you you a lot of times you do it by modulating your message and kind of being a compromising sellout, going to work for the government for a while and getting credentials there. This revolving door problem, so that tends to corrupt people, or at least make them afraid to even look into what the truth might be because they don't care. They want to make their money more than they want to be correct on ethical theory. Um, you're right. You're right. And, and the other side of the coin, Stefan, are those who want to become martyrs for the cause. And, and you know, there's nobody, nobody's helped by your becoming a martyr. You know, uh, society is not, if you want to take the utilitarian argument, and, and you're not, your family's not personally, but we, you and I have seen that too. A lot of people who devote themselves uh, uh, to the cause and almost do want to go down as a martyr, you know. And, and so there's a sellout, there's a martyr, and then there's that if it's possible, that happy medium. You know the truth, and you're trying to seek out the truth, but you know you have to live yeah. in 2013 America. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's, I've always kind of thought it was weird that uh, there's this idea among some, especially the activist-type libertarians, right, that we have some kind of duty to uh, not only be an activist, which you know takes a lot of time and sometimes money. It takes away from your ability to make money in a regular career or whatever, um, for for the benefit of the cause or something, and that's almost altruistic, right? And you even hear yeah, Randians right. talking like this. Um, if you remember at that at that 1989 conference we went to, I, I I met some guys that when they heard I was in law school, they started mocking me because I would have to take the the bar exam and I would have to become a member of the bar, which means I have to swear, you know, an oath to be an officer of the court. And they were saying, you know, you can't do that. It's it's immoral to do that and all this kind of stuff. And so if if that was true, then no one could be a lawyer. No one could be a doctor, I guess, under socialized medicine. So all the, the all the principled people who care for liberty would have to marginalize themselves and be basically losers. And what kind of ability would they have to spread the message of liberty, or or even you know, uh, you know, be a successful citizen? Now I do think there are some things you shouldn't do. I mean, you shouldn't be an IRS tax agent. You know, you shouldn't be a guard at the federal prisons. Um, you probably shouldn't even be a soldier. In, in the army, but it's a practical, prudential, moral matter about how to draw the line, and you know you can drive on the roads. Yeah, you shouldn't martyr yourself by saying I'm not going to drive on the roads. Um, those kind of issues. So I think it's a practical thing, and the government makes it difficult. But I don't think we have an obligation to be martyrs or even to be activists. Um, I think your only obligation is to be a good person and not violate other people's rights and not advocate that the state do these terrible things. You know, I met a young man recently um, who, uh, it was interesting, he he had read most of Rand and Leonard Peikoff and Mises and uh, talked a good line, uh, apparently, or seemingly, and when I asked him what he wanted to do for his career, he said that he wants to go work for a state senator. So, you know, I... Will he make a difference? I mean, you remember when uh, when Greenspan um, in '87 was named head of the Fed. So many people thought, "Oh, great! You know, he's gonna it's a ploy, or it's you know, he's gonna bring Ayn Rand's ideas to the Fed." But a lot of us were also disappointed. 
And I felt the same way in talking to this young man. I mean, you know, did he not see the contradiction? Maybe it was family pressure or something. I don't know. But I don't know. I don't think you can really change the culture uh, by working for a, a senator. Do you? <laughs> no, I don't. I, I, I don't think. Um, I think there's two things wrong with being, quote, disappointed in Greenspan. Um, number one is you, to be surprised is ridiculous. I mean, you know, just like if you have a welfare system, you know, you have a trough of money people can come get for free, people are going to be attracted to it and they're going to go to it. So to be surprised that if you have these institutions of power that people will respond to it is ridiculous. And just because you understand the gold system and understand the government shouldn't be doing this doesn't mean that it's not in your personal interest to go do it. So no one should be surprised that Greenspan did this. Um, and But to be disappointed is almost like this kind of politician hero worship kind of thing. Uh, where your hopes are dashed and your hero is just disappointing you. It's I don't think you should look up to these people at all anyway. Um, so you know when a, when a congressman like Rand Paul or even Ron Paul with some of his votes or actions does something that's I think is unlibertarian, I'm not disappointed. This is politics. You know you have to be yeah, realistic I, no, about it. I, I agree with that, and I think that's kind of a hard lesson for a lot of people. But again, it goes back to putting their, their faith or trust, if you will, in the political movement, our politicians, yes. and that's not going to happen. One thing that is bothersome, and this would be a whole other topic, but I can tell you as, a, as an entrepreneur and a sm very small businessman, um, the regulation burden is getting harder and harder, right. and I see a lot of people... You know, Mississippi, a lot of businesses here do rely on, on state and, you know, federal monies. Um, and they're they're very willing to take it, and they almost have to take it. Oh, and now it seems as if a lot of businesses are lining up for that type of money. I mean, you know, even for, for advertising campaigns, they'll get a grant from the, the city or something for a hundred grand or $150,000, which may not sound like a lot, but to a small business, it's, it's a hell of a lot of money. Right, and right. I'm seeing that more and more, and it's almost as if you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Right. If you believe in the old uh, Horatio Alger, you know, work ethic, it's it's very difficult now, and a lot of people are, are cutting. I'm not going to say cutting corners, but doing things that perhaps they wouldn't have done 20 years ago because the economy is so much worse. It's it's a tough predicament, Stephen. It really is. Um, I know, and I. You know, these young people trying to come up and be entrepreneurs, it's, it's going to be hard, harder for them, too, and a lot of them are going to be disillusioned. I agree. Well, um, why don't you uh, – you got anything you want to uh, to plug? You said you have this upcoming book on Aristotle. What, what else – don't you have a, uh, um, a journal? Yeah. Do you have a website for the journal? My website is probizms.com, P-R-O-B-I-Z-M-S.com, and we are in the process – in fact, I'm meeting with some people uh, tomorrow – uh, to really redo the site and have a, a, a nice new YouTube channel and so on and so forth. It is primarily for, for businesses here in this state, but we, uh, we have some writers who have been published uh, in you know Huffington Post and the Daily Beast and, and people of all political persuasions. I try to, to get as many ideas on the table as I can uh, in, in my publication. Uh, did, did you get permission and, from the high priest of libertarianism before doing that? What's that? Did you get oh, perm yeah. permission from the, the you know the hierarchy, the priest, before doing that? Yeah, after I went out and burned a few books and made uh, <laughs> sacrifices, I did that. And yeah, the book on Aristotle. I'm hoping uh, it will be out later this year, and, and certainly I'll let people know. You know, it's funny because um, I, I having a, a daughter, a young child, as you know, you have a young son. Um, I noticed that there were children's books about everybody from Shaquille O'Neal to Tim Tebow to you know. Uh, uh, Einstein, but I had never come across a children's book on who I still think is the greatest thinker of all time, Aristotle. So I took it upon myself to, to write such a book. And again, it's my pleasure to have my daughter do the illustrating. So we're going to have that out uh, later this year. We'll see. You know, I'd we'll love see to see it. I'd love, send, send me a free PDF copy. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, you know, nine ninety five. Uh, plus shooting and <laughs> yeah, you got, you, hey, you got to put food on the table, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll get it copyrighted. How about that? <laughs> I'll help Listen, you. Let me, just, let me just say, I know we got to go, but uh, as a friend and someone who has, has known you uh, for a long, long time, I'm, you know, and people may not realize it; they may have just come to know you, but you're, you're truly an original thinker. 
you're an independent guy, and and uh, uh, a lot of us are very proud of you. So so keep up keep up the good work. It's it's tremendous work you are doing. Thanks, Jack. I appreciate that, and uh, good luck with your pursuits, and uh, and we'll get together soon. We'll do it, my friend. Thanks for having me on the show. All right, talk to you later. Bye bye. Bye bye.